So today, in my uh, 14 minutes and, and 10 seconds, I'm going to talk about translating psoriasis guidelines uh, into practice. Here are my disclosures, and I have also been a member of the AAD NPF uh, Guidelines Committee for psoriasis covering uh, treatment guidelines from topicals to systemic medications. So today we're first going to take a look at the general guideline-based approach to treatment selection. And then we're also going to take a look at a few special populations, those with psoriatic arthritis, those with a history of malignancy, as well as tuberculosis. So hopefully we can all um, learn some pearls as dermalorians uh, at this meeting. So when we think about psoriasis and classification of psoriasis patients with regards to the treatment, the International Psoriasis Council have issued new uh, recommendations in how we classify them. So instead of moderate, uh, severe, and versus mild, they, we talked about those who are candidates for topical therapy versus those who are candidates for systemic therapy. And if you look at the candidates for systemic therapy, they include patients who have body surface area 10% or more, uh, having, or having disease in specialized areas such as the face, palms and soles, and, um, and, and genitalia, for example, and also those failing topical therapies. Now, I think these uh, new classification system is very helpful, but sometimes our payers may not agree with these particular systems, and then we still have to go through prior authorizations. So, First, I'm going to talk about topical therapies in psoriasis. Essentially, most of our topical therapies that have phase three clinical data are considered evidence uh, grade A and strongly recommended by the guidelines. Few pearls there. Uh, we are uh, moving away from reactive treatment to proactive uh, treatment approach uh, in psoriasis, much like it is in atopic dermatitis. And that is, if you treat a patient to clear, and then you want to, once, even if it's clear or almost clear, once you want to, once that person achieved that stage, you then want to treat those areas that are now clinically quiescent, but are the areas that frequently flare with either topical steroids or non-steroidal agents. And the recommendation for that is then typically twice weekly treatment, preferably a Monday or a Thursday regimen for this proactive treatment uh, for those areas. Um, and you can mix and match the different agents. So you can treat a patient clear with the topical steroids and then do this proactive twice weekly treatment, for example, um, uh, with the non-steroidal agents. However, there are newer agents that are coming onto the market, and I think that may actually impact how we write psoriasis guidelines in the future. I know later on uh, we have other speakers that's going to cover this in more detail, um, but topinarov uh, is a newer agent that was, uh, that was just approved, and the mechanism of action, as you can see here, involves a, a number of different pathways. The mainly, the one that's responsible for psoriasis is a decrease in the Th17 cytokines, and therefore decreasing the psoriasis uh, inflammation. One of the things that we learned from Topinarov trials is that uh, when we look at the left-hand side of two slides, we see baseline and then 12 weeks, this patient getting a lot better. But if we follow the patient trajectory, and that is if we stop the treatment and then see how long the effect of Topinarov is, what we see is that off treatment for 12 weeks, that's the third picture, the patient remained clear. And then in this particular patient, off the treatment for 24 weeks, the patient is clear. So this is something that we haven't really seen uh, uh, as much in the topical treatment for psoriasis. And overall, the median duration for which patients remain clear or almost clear is around four months. So you treat a patient with clear, you don't do anything, the patient doesn't do anything, and the median duration to maintaining clear or almost clear is about uh, four months. Okay, go moving on to oral therapies. Our guidelines for oral therapies uh, is quite specific for the various traditional oral therapies, and I'm going to kind of briefly go over those. So in methotrexate, the guidelines uh, still recommend its use in those, especially those uh, lacking good health insurance or those Medicare patients without significant comorbidities. Um, it can work in psoriatic arthritis, but if your patient has enthesitis or dactylitis associated with psoriatic arthritis, methotrexate does not cover those particular domains. The range of methotrexate dosing is from 7.5 to 25 milligrams per week. Uh, the median dose typically used uh, for most of our patients is 15 milligrams per week. 
here are some of the contraindications uh, for reference. It is contraindicated, uh, obviously, in pregnancy, breastfeeding, and those with severe renal disease. Some of the common side effects, especially if you push methotrexate to 20 milligrams or 25 milligrams per week, patients are going to have nausea and diarrhea. And it is recommended that one gram to five grams of folic acid daily, typically on the days not patient not taking the methotrexate, can alleviate some of, the, uh, some of these side effects. Hair loss uh, can occur with methotrexate, but that is typically temporary and reversible. The three biggies that we want to think about in terms of methotrexate toxicity include hepatotoxicity, and this is probably the biggest one. So knowing what are some of the risk factors for patients developing hepatotoxicity is important. Especially, I want to highlight diabetes. Then we have pulmonary fibrosis and myelosuppression, which are more idiopathic um, uh, adverse effects associated with methotrexate. Okay, so now if we talk about oral therapies, and if you think about uh, what in our traditional oral therapies act like a Skywalker, Darth Vader type of uh, agent, any guesses of which traditional one I'm going to talk about? So some, something that's as fast as uh, the Skywalker, but then later turn on you. Cyclosporin, very good. So cyclosporin is used for our crisis patient. It can be very, very effective, but it's typically used only as a bridge to longer-term therapies. So for cyclosporin, we want to start at four to five milligrams per kilogram per day. So if you're going to use cyclosporin, we want to use the adequate dose, and you want to calculate that, and then you divide that total dose into the BID dosing for our patients. It can act fairly quickly, and it can, uh, can be very effective in most of our patients. This slide is just for reference in terms of the baseline labs and the monitoring labs that we need to check for cyclosporin. Very, very important to check their blood pressure regularly because you will see elevations in blood pressure in most patients. And also follow their renal function because you may need to adjust cyclosporin levels. Now here's the Darth Vader part, nephrotox, if you use cyclosporin long enough, and that is uh, studies have shown if you use the cyclosporin continuously for a year and a half or two years, they will develop irreversible nephrotoxicity. And acetretin, switching gears to acetretin, um, so our vitamin A modulator, it's used typically for moderate plaque psoriasis due to its modest efficacy. It can also be uh, used in with palmar plantar psoriasis, and especially those with a history of skin cancer, um, as it can have some chemopreventative effects. Here is uh, the range that's typically used. The higher the dose of acetretin, the more we're likely to see the side effects uh, involved with xerosis, for example, and hair loss. Here are some of the contraindications, so do not use acetretin in women of childbearing age. That's probably the biggest one. And, uh, and then moving on to a premolast. Here is a premolast. Um, the key thing uh, to remember is that if you deem a patient to be a, uh, a candidate for a premolast, um, a premolast is now approved for all severities, so they can have mild disease and could also be, uh, can also use a premolast. If a patient has severe renal failure, we do need to adjust for the dose of a premolast, um, and then you decrease it by half of the approved dose. All right, so we are going to move on, and we are going to talk about choosing a biologic. And so the first step in choosing a biologic is really to determine whether a patient has psoriatic arthritis or not. So this is the overall treatment approach. And when we think about choosing uh, a biologic for patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, of the 11 biologics that are listed here, all of them are approved for both indications with the exception of two medications, brodalumab, which is not approved for PSA in the US, but is approved for PSA outside of the US, and then tildrakizumab. Here is uh, the network meta-analysis showing the relative efficacy of the medications next to each other. Essentially, for our IL-17 and IL-23 medications, most of them have come up onto the top. You need to treat about 2.5 patients to get one person. That's posi on 100. That's completely clear. So now when we think about psoriasis, we think about the skin psoriasis, we think about the peripheral arthritis, as well as axial arthritis. And when we're thinking about axial arthritis, um, psoriatic arthritis especially, we want to pay special attention to the DIP joint as well as the PIP joint. Um, those are most likely to be in involved in patients with peripheral arthritis. 
So this is important. So I, I like to simplify things a little bit, and I divide them into the, the three different classes. So when choosing a, a biologic in adults, TNF inhibitors are great for those with psoriatic arthritis that's both peripheral and axial. Their efficacy is relatively lower compared to, in the skin, is relatively lower compared to IL-17 and IL-23 medications. You want to avoid them in those with demyelinating disease and hepatitis B, and they may not be preferred for those with history of latent TB or advanced T CHF. For IL-17 inhibitors, they have great penetration in both the skin as well as joint. And so it's really ideal for, for many patients and for psoriatic arthritis. You don't really have to worry about if they have peripheral or axial psoriatic arthritis. It has very good penetration and efficacy in both of those domains. We want to avoid IL-17 inhibitors in those with a personal history with IBD. This is screenable and uh, it occurs in about 2 to 3 percent of patients with psoriasis. And uh, the oral candidiasis of the approved medication so far, the rates are low and manageable, and patients can typically still continue their IL-17 inhibitors. For IL-23 inhibitors, they have good, robust skin efficacy, as we know, and many of them are also approved for psoriatic arthritis, including gisalcumab, rizankizumab, and ustekinumab. They had advantage of being convenient, right, few injections for our patients. I think the data in psoriatic arthritis is still evolving, so we're looking forward to gathering more of that. Here is a baseline laboratory monitoring for patients with biologics. Um, the main thing to notice that we have really simplified our uh, baseline monitoring guidelines. Now we're going to go on to dose escalation. So what happens if, uh, if your approved biologic doesn't work in the approved dosing? So here are the overarching themes. Number one is that who are the good candidates for dose escalation? Number one is obese patients. Maybe they're just not enough drugs, so it's a pharmacodynamic problem. Number two is that the patient initially received good response, but then the response waned. And then, um, and then the general strategy for dose escalation is that more frequent injections um, at the same dose. So you shorten the interval between the injections rather than increase the, uh, the amount of medication you give per dose. We're going to talk about this, these charts a little bit later in the discussion section, but here are examples of how the dose escalation uh, can occur based on the guidelines. Now switching, you're about to, you, you're tired of dose escalation, the payers are not paying, um, you're thinking about switching uh, biologics. So for primary failures, our patient who never responded to optimally to a biologic in the first place, I typically wait at least six months to switch, and then I typically would then consider switching to a different class of biologics. What about secondary failures? So those who had responded to a biologic but then lost response, we talked about dose escalation earlier. Um, for this class of, uh, of patients, your options are more numerous. So you can either switch within class or across class. So you might want to consider switching within class when it is, uh, a, when it is something that you want to manage, for example, PSA, and you want to stay, for example, within the IL-17 class. Now, for patients with history of malignancy, I divide them into three different categories and how we think about this problem. So first is a category of patients who have a history of internal solid organ, solid organ malignancy in remission for greater than five years. Where we have the most data is with ustekinumab, our IL-1223 inhibitor followed by our, our IL-17 and IL-23 inhibitor. So those are generally considered safe. TNF inhibitors, data is mixed, but overall when you look at the preponderance of evidence, they're also generally considered safe as well. But I will probably go to ustekinumab first or IL-17 and IL-23 inhibitors. For those with history of liquid tumors, regardless of remission status, so it's history of lymphoma or current lymphoma or leukemia, and those with internal solid organ malignancy in remission for less than five years, or those with just active malignancy, uh, in general, biologics uh, are to be avoided. And then finally, those with just a history of, uh, with a history of skin cancer, so uh, keratinocytes, uh, carcinomas, BCCs or SCCs, in general, the use of biologics is permissible with regular skin checks. 
And then finally, with tuberculosis, you can, you can manage it, especially if you can't get the patients to the ID, uh, for example, and just here are just some of the tips for managing it. Latent TB, six to nine month regimen, and then here my last slide here, the latent TB with three to four months regimen, this is all in your hand, handouts, which I prefer with isoniazid and rifampin. And with that, may the guidelines be with you.